open with prayer. Father, we are eternally grateful for uh, who you are, your great heart, that behind all that you do, all that is great as pertains to purpose, intent, will, that there's a heart behind that and more heart than anything else. That is not simply purpose that drives you, but love that motivates from within. And Lord, we lean into the fact of your love. That's never a question of if. And may you make that real to our own hearts. That Lord, that question or doubt or fear, Holy Spirit, is dealt with by you to such an extent that we never doubt nor fear your love. Your love that ties in perfectly with your intent and purpose. And that the scope of that love is far beyond my ability to fully understand or grasp. But love all that you show us, all oh Lord, all that you reveal to us of your heart, coupled with your intent and purpose. Thank you, Lord, that you're teaching us more and more to come. That that invitation stands open to us at all times. Drive that deeply within us, Holy Spirit. Don't let it be stolen by the lies or accusations, intimations of the enemy. May it be firmly rooted in us by your work, Holy Spirit. Firmly rooted in us experientially. We ask even now, Holy Spirit, take that deeper, that truth and revelation of your heart deeper within us to combat and overcome all fear, all doubt. Your love is greater than the lies of the enemy, the misrepresentations of Christianity, greater than the power of law, and particularly Christian law, greater than condemnation. You're greater than that, Lord. You are true love. That, Father, I can't see a proper definition of in any language. You're simply so far beyond it. We worship you for who you are. And you remain the same and do not change. Therefore, Lord, we come again tonight. We approach the throne of grace. And once again, we ask, establish in us this internal altar of communion with you. Let that fire burn continuously. May it never go out. May we forever be those who call upon your name, who come to you. Who you, as David said, oh, you who hear prayer, all men come to you. We come. You invited us, and so, Lord, we come. We refuse to go down a path of condemnation and fear that causes us to run away rather than run to you. We are blessed beyond our own understanding and comprehension that we can come boldly before the throne of grace. But we come and take advantage of your invitation, of your great heart in this matter, asking you continuously for that nearness in the relationship that is so precious to become more and more 
our experience and reality. We say the nearness of God is our good. That there be no distance, but a true, lasting fellowship with you. We thank you, Lord. Amen. I'm going to recap a little bit tonight and then talk <clears throat> a little bit about one, you know, thing that's been on my heart to, to talk about. We basically have covered overall, this is just a, in, a, in a major topical type of way, we've covered six specific facts, truths that are meant, again, all of this meant to bring us to an experience of knowing the Lord. And you guys know that this is a journey that has a beginning, <laughs> it simply has no ending. But that's beautiful about the Lord. The more you come to know him, the more we realize there is to know of him. So that just holds our hearts in a place of joy, truly, a joy. Okay, I don't know him like I want to. You'll be saying that 10 years from now. <laughs> just get used to that fact that he, the more you know him, the more you realize there is to know him. More and more and more. So don't be discouraged by the journey and by what we don't know or don't see. We talked about this some, but six basic things. Number one, we talked about the, this issue of come. You know, come to me, Jesus said there in Matthew chapter 11. And in Hebrews 4, we're to come boldly before the throne of grace to find help in our time of need. Secondly, we talked about quieting the soul, particularly out of Psalm 131 verse 2, where David talks about stilling and quieting the soul. Now, we all know this. That's going to demand the work of the Holy Spirit to help us. If man could quiet his soul without God, we wouldn't need God at all. It is an impossibility for man, natural man, to quiet his own soul. It's going to demand the supernatural work of the Holy Spirit. We know this, don't we, guys? It's not by might nor power in any of this. It is by the Spirit who is ready, willing, and able. And he's not withholding himself. He's not, you know, stiff-arming any of us. God's saying, come. Therefore, the Spirit of God is saying, come. Come and be helped in every area. And that's God's help. That's not just man's help. It's God's help. And it's always, the pattern of that is always from within than, than to without. Always from within to without. It's because he deals with foundation, God does. So the internal foundation of our own life versus his life is always in view with God. And that divine exchange of living by his life that he offers us. So quieting the soul, its importance, we recognize it when we go before the Lord that it takes a certain amount of time for the Holy Spirit to help us to put away all that's been going on in our month, in our week, in our day and focus in upon the Lord himself. There's just a lot of stuff that goes on. And uh, it wants to rush in when you get before the Lord. And you can see both the flesh and the enemy both at this. The soul's, in, in, it's incapable in and of itself of uh, trusting God, believing God. It must be conquered by the Holy Spirit subjugated, not annihilated, subjugated to the will of God. The soul's not meant to be annihilated, it's meant to be subjugated. We need our soul to relate to the natural things. That's why God gave it to us. The soul relates to the natural things. Thus, it makes it incapable of spiritual understanding in and of itself. Its realm is the natural. God is spirit. So an entirely other than organ called the human spirit joined to the Holy Spirit is where our relationship with God is going to be founded. 
But you understand then that the natural can't upset that relationship. It's not meant to if our soul is under the hand of the Lord. No matter what event happens out here, no matter what external thing happens to us, God remains the same. Isn't that right? Yeah. Think that through. That's living by the life of another, though. You know, we're not upset by the externals. Bad things happen to God's people with regularity. We're living in a fallen world, and Satan is specific to target us. Isn't he? Well, we don't get a complex on that, but is Satan out to get you? You better believe he is. And so is God, <laughs> in a good way. Thank God. <laughs> God wants you way, way more for loving intent and purpose. So we don't want to, you know, be in, in the sad place of denying that, hey, we have an enemy. We also wanna, don't want to give him so much glory that we forget that God's greater. He who's with us is greater than he who is against us. Isn't that true? So the quieting of the soul then allows all the external activity pulling at us, demanding the fears associated with it. The doubt. That realm is filled with doubt. The soulish realm is filled with doubt. Filled with fear. It is disconnected from God. Adam sinned by his soul. It was his soul that was tempted in the Garden of Eden by the, the beauty of a fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. That natural fruit tempted his soul, not his spirit. He fell then to the power of his soul and brought disconnect spiritually between him and God. So man's spirit was corrupted by his choosing of his soul. And man's spirit falls in its relationship with God by the choosing of his soul. And his soul becomes elevated to dominion. And the spirit of man falls completely, below even the flesh. Anyway, that, I know you guys know that, but I'm just being foundational in what I'm saying to us. So we can see that the power of the soul is real, very, very real. And so to see the Holy Spirit reconquer our soul and bring divine order within us means the Spirit of God in lordship within our human spirit, ruling over our soul and our flesh, divine order reestablished by God's entrance into us. That's the only way it can happen. So much of the church, you guys know, is deceived around this issue and understand the distinction of soul and spirit, don't understand the fall, don't understand the dangers of the soulish realm. And now when modern day Christianity has us going after everything to do with the soul. Right. And the life in the spirit is almost extinct. That doesn't bode well for our day, does it? <clears throat> so, but when the Holy Spirit comes in, he brings order. And so we have, but we do not possess and are not possessed by it, whatever we have. It's not our life, and it's temporal. Isn't that right? All that we have in this realm, I don't mean evil things now. I'm just talking about the things. You can have those things but they must not have us, you know. And God tests us in those areas. We know that. All of us in the room do. He'll test us. Money's not evil. The love of it is. <clears throat> Loving that more than the Lord, that's the issue, isn't it? So, or anything else like that. Just use money as an instance there. But greed's based around how much more money do you need? Just one more dollar is for the rich person. That's how much they need. One more. <laughs> Always one more. Never satisfied. Isn't that right? Anyway, so we talked about the quieting of our soul and the importance of the quieting of our soul. And that demands the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> so in this world, we're going to have tribulation. 
That's what Jesus said. But be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. Well, people say, well, man, that's good for Jesus. What about us? <laughs> He's saying, though, this to us. Christ in you, Christ in myself. That life that he is within us has overcome. Mm -hmm. Now, that's not some doctrine as people have made it to be. See, I'm overcome. It says so. That's not what that says. We're deceived. The key to that is the relationship. Who's living? That's the key. Is my soul still living? Is self still on the throne? And people don't want to deal with that truth. They don't want to couple that truth to these so-called doctrines of truth. Having a doctrine right does not mean it's real to us. The reality of any truth is the measure of the fullness of the Lord that in, is in us. Can you imagine, just sorry, a brand new believer claiming all the divine doctrines as being true of them before the journey's even started? How many can say, foolish? <laughs> <laughs> Because it's going to be tested, and we're going to see immediately who's living, Christ or me. And so in my 30-something years of being with the Lord, I can guarantee you this. There are still large segments of the land of Canaan that God needs to conquer in me. It's just true. To deny that is to be foolish. You know, when I look at him and who he is, and I see that life, it's easy for me to say, well, I'll tell you what, it's measured living. I need his increase. I need a greater measure of the Lord. That shouldn't be shame to us. It's just real. So, all right, so that was number two, quieting the soul. Number three Praying by the Spirit or praying in the Spirit. We, talk, we talked about Romans 8. We don't know how to pray as we should. The Holy Spirit helps us in our prayers. Tied that in somewhat with Ephesians 6. Always praying in the Spirit, Paul taught. So the Spirit praying through us, that, you know, that's bigger than just praying in tongues. Though praying in tongues is a wonderful dynamic. I'm not against that at all. I pray in the Spirit a lot that way. But you can pray in the Spirit and know the mind of the Lord and, and it be outside of tongues. And so that Spirit-directed praying on heavenly ground to where we have by revelation what is God's mind, what is God's heart in the eternals. And we're in alignment with that, praying according, according to his original thought, original intent, as if man never failed. So praying in the Spirit, <clears throat> we talked a little bit about that. So much more can be said about all of these things, but the key is asking the Holy Spirit for ourselves and going down these paths with the Holy Spirit. That's why I bring them up by points. Going down these paths with the Holy Spirit, going back to these passages, and there's many others, and asking for greater understanding by the Holy Spirit of what it means to pray in, with, according to, by, all those words, the Spirit. So, uh, and that's particularly true in every area. <laughs> Even in warfare. Maybe especially in warfare. If you look at the context of Ephesians 6, you're dealing not just with flesh and blood. We're dealing with principalities. So the church has got to rise, let's say it this way, in its understanding of true warfare. <clears throat> this time has been so much about intimacy, rightly so. Without intimacy with the Lord, any warrior can be easily defeated. And will be. But a warrior who has foundationally intimacy the life of the Lord growing, and I mean in the sense of taking ground, his increase, 
in the land that we are, Canaan. Warrior and warriors coming forward in that realm are going to directly, and they have always done so, directly challenge the powers that be in the heavens and on the earth. We're meant to. Not foolishly, not out of order, not of our own mind, but by direction of God through the Holy Spirit, through the Lamb within us, so maturity must come to his people, and it will. It's been, it's been clearly spoken of in the scriptures that that will be a case. There will be a level of maturity in a portion of his body, a portion, a remnant of his body. That's all it'll be is a remnant. Sad to say, it's not God's heart. It's just the way it's going to play out because of people's choices. There will be a level of maturity. I mean this, God's fullness. That's actually maturity. God's fullness in that people they've allowed the government of God in its, in its strength to be in them and among them and all that that entails the will of God the mind of Christ the full thought of God's intent and purpose and are governed according to his mind and they will challenge in the end, as is clearly seen in the scriptures, they will challenge the witnesses particularly, will challenge the powers that be. And ain't just two of them in Jerusalem. There's a whole lot more of them than two. It just happens to mention two in Jerusalem. But those two in Jerusalem are directly challenging the power of darkness in that city. And they have that city under God's control up until the time God allows them to be killed. And in the killing of them, they'd have done better not to kill them. Because when they come back up in three days, there's a price to pay, consequences for their death. So understand the great showdown that is upon us that we're moving forward into we're not there but we're meant to be there and get there and we're going to a remnant's going to get there the uh anyway that's that wasn't part of what we talked about <laughs> so, <laughs> so we were on three preparing praying by the spirit in romans eight but also then number four praying the scriptures and I talked about this there's different dynamics that I wanted to touch in this dynamic of intimacy sometimes we want our our spiritual vocabulary so to speak to be increased in how to pray uh, and so we talked about praying the scriptures the psalms are ready made for that they were actually prayers and song they were sung many of them so uh, and praying through the scriptures, be they the Psalms or other passages that lend themselves to prayer, um, you watch the Holy Spirit take the scriptures, he loves to do this, and bring revelation to our hearts of prayer and how that works. Even when you look at those Psalms, there's a lot of them surrounding the enemy, isn't there? Dealing with the enemy you know, break their teeth out, all kinds of stuff. But, but turn that, you know, if you don't like that on the human realm, you'll like it more and more in the coming days. Right. <laughs> Take it to the demonic realm. And realize, as they did in that day, the powers that be behind these armies, the powers that be behind those who are antagonistic to God. So... <clears throat> With the coming darkness as it increases, and it is dramatically increasing on a weekly basis, it seems to be in this nation, mm -hmm. evil is going to come out from every crevice. What was once hidden and was unacceptable is now acceptable and is coming into full light of what it is. The body of Christ is going to have to be ready. Bring the consequences right down onto their heads. Bring death right to their doorstep. I'm not kidding you. So the secret place, number five, the secret place being the secret. And so, so the secret place, we talked about this, having the secret place. Um, you know, first and foremost, we know this, 
The Lord wants the secret place internally. That's a 24-7 secret place where Christ dwells in us. And the relationship allows for 24-7 exchange. But, however, then a key to that journey, because, you know, we can say, well, that we need it 24-7, but how many realize that it has to be built within us? And that's a journey. So part of the demand, it was with the Lord. That's why we talked about this um, last Wednesday night. The Lord would get alone. He would get into an undistracted place and spend time with his Father. So the secret place for him would be sometimes the wilderness, you know, sometimes different places that he would get away from his own disciples even. As much as he loved them and he was mentoring, he was training them, he had to get away from them in order to be alone with his father. His father was living in him, just like Christ is living in us, but he still went and got away. So did he have the secret place within? Yes. But did it also demand a place that he could go and so-called have not only an altar internally, but another altar that he could go to that was his secret place, away from everything? Yes. And we want to see that. Wherever it is in your home, find a place to where it is no distractions, is as quiet as it can possibly be. Create that place. If your whole home can be that, amen. That's great. If it can't be, choose a place. Uh, even if it can be, choose a place to where that's a place you can go to. Other members of your family as well can go to that place and that place has no phones. <laughs> Seriously. That place is uh, unique. By setting that place, you're saying something to the Lord. That you're more important than everything else. That you have absolute sovereignty over my ear right now, my ears, my heart, my mind, my will, my purpose. I give you this place. All other things are excluded for this time. That says something to the Lord. Now you'll have to fight to maintain that because immediately the enemy and your flesh is going to say, but... Be careful of those things that want to argue you out of that level of commitment. Go ahead, find that place, establish that place, and have in that place, this is the rule of this place, that God has first priority. Everything else for this time is on the hold. And so what that does then, when you do that in the natural, it helps you to understand it more in the internal with your, in your own human spirit. So here's how that would actually work. In my soul, my soul is for this external, okay? A relationship with these external things and flesh. But my spirit is set completely apart to God. And the dominion of God lies with my spirit over my soul, over my flesh. These things have no place of priority greater than God in my spirit. Joined with me in spirit. One with him in spirit. That's what scripture actually says about it. See, so you establish that understanding within here, even by the natural act. It goes hand in hand, actually. The Lord shows us that, doesn't he? He shows us that with his Father. I believe he had that to absolute perfection. His relationship with his Father was that real. We know it was. We see the examples of it all the time. Even in the most emotional times of his life, let's say it that way, when there are most emotional things Natural things were pulling at him. 
the internal relationship with his father took priority and precedence. That's easily proven in John 11, at the death of Lazarus. And some of his closest friends and his own disciples were saying all these things. Had you been here, he would not have died. You know, and Jesus weeps, but he's not weeping because Lazarus is dead, because he's about to resurrect him. He's weeping because those people can't understand the purpose and plan and will of God and do not trust him even more. Do not trust him. I don't believe he's weeping over Lazarus whatsoever. He goes there to bring him into resurrection. He says so before he ever goes. He waits so that he will die. So the glory of God can be seen and Lazarus coming back alive. He tells them finally, his own disciples, Lazarus is asleep. He meant dead. I go to wake him up. So, you know, put yourself in that situation when all the voices... As we get in these situations, don't we? <laughs> when all other voices are saying, all other outside, outward stimuli are saying this, 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 this. Everything but trust God. Everything but believe in Him. Everything but, let's think about it, of the peace that transcends understanding. Of a relationship that is above the natural. You see, there's where, that's where the rubber will hit the road, isn't it? We have to face those situations. And they're there for us to help us in this journey to allow the Lord to take more and more internal ground, more and more living by his life, his life living in us, that foundation of life, more and more. So that gets proven in the journey. It gets refined. It gets deepened by the testing. The testing doesn't destroy it. It can deepen that life, that increase. So the secret place is a beautiful reality that God wants all of his people to enjoy. <clears throat> this is where I go and meet with God, specifically. Now, what we'll talk about here in a moment expands that, but it's important at a foundational level, let me say it that way, that we have that secret place. We'll establish a secret place. It may be outside. Could be a little challenging in the rain and <laughs> good snow, but could be outside. It could be that that secret place when the weather's good is outside, but inside there's also another one. It's not bad to have both. <clears throat> but whatever is demanded there, ask the Lord for wisdom and help to see it established, and he'll help us. It's going to be fought over. You know, if we could all do this and build our own homes, <laughs> we can't. But if we could, we could have that built in right from the beginning. You know what I'm saying? But we don't all have that luxury, do we? Most of us don't ever have that luxury. But if you do have that ability to do that, then you include that in the very plan. There's an honoring of to God that goes on in that that I think is beautiful, don't you all? It says, man, Lord, I want you to have this place. And uh, we're not going to allow this, 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 this. For instance, no TV will ever be brought into this room. Yeah. Say, well, that's religious, is it? Yeah. What makes us think that? We're saying that God's more real and that we're in need of him more than we are entertainment, yeah. even the news. That God can tell us the news, too. And a lot of times it's way better. <laughs> it's way better news. <laughs> and way more accurate. <laughs> he doesn't lie. He doesn't hide things like being done to us. So, But anyway, I've just stressed in that the secret place. Now this last thing, spend the reminder, remainder of the time talking about the opportune moment. The opportune moment. So we have that secret place with the Lord that we go to. And that becomes increasingly the building up of the internal secret place here. Secret place of the Most High. God dwelling in us in our spirit. Our spirit being captivated, conquered under the direct dominion of the Holy Spirit. Who then turns to our soul and thus our flesh to bring conquering there. 
the deliverance of our souls. That's what Peter says. But let's talk about opportune moments and not bypassing opportune moments. You're driving down the road and the Spirit of the Lord comes on you. What do you do? You give in. <laughs> you recognize and you turn in to that. Seriously. Now that may create some challenges. Well, how do I drive and communicate with the Lord? It can be done really easy. It really can. And the Lord will shift from being your co-pilot to your pilot. What well, he'd rather be anyway. He's not into being a co-pilot. He'd rather be your pilot. Because if he's only co-pilot, we're headed in the wrong direction. <laughs> the co-pilot and the pilot are headed two different directions. <laughs> so what we want is the Lord to be the leading. So I'm saying opportune moment, you're driving down the road or wherever, but I'm just using this as an example. And suddenly you, you sense the presence of the Lord. What you want to do is turn towards the Lord in that moment. Opportune moment, an opportune time. Outside of your normal routine, be aware of this, helps to build that secret place in here. It helps the sensitivity level. The more you turn toward him, the more it's going to happen. And the more he'll expand it to happen in different places. Opportune time, you got 45 minute drive in the morning to work. Let that 45 minutes be a secret time between you and the Lord. It maybe can't get, you maybe can't close your eyes, maybe you can, but <laughs> maybe you can't get as secret as what you'd like to have the other, but I'm saying use the opportune moments in the opportune time, be aware of them. It's an awareness dynamic. I've seen that happen through the years so many times. I've uh, been caught up into heaven while I was driving. Now, how many can say that makes for an interesting road trip? <laughs> and I was dictating to my son Nathaniel, who was sitting in the seat beside me, all that was being said to me in heaven. And I, I couldn't drive and write, at least I didn't think I could. So I had Nathaniel writing what I was seeing and, and what was being said to me while I was driving down the road. And that was a lengthy, lengthy time there. And so I'm just giving you an example, one example. There's all kinds of dynamics that go on. If the Lord, believe you me, there have been a lot more happened prior to that that allowed the Lord to take me into that arena while I was driving. And it's happened on numerous, numerous occasions through the years. All I'm saying to you is that just didn't happen a one-time thing. Many, many times before I've learned to let driving be an opportune moment, as well as on the lawnmower, as well as wherever, in the workplace. If it's good for God, it's good for me. <laughs> if he decides, all right, now's a good time, I'm with you. You know what I mean? He can restrain whatever needs to be restrained if you trust him in it. You know, I, I remember seeing this happen at, when the first was, uh, you know, going down this path with the Lord. And I'm thinking, see, here's the problem. I'm thinking, well, that can't work. You know, you can't do that. And, and God would challenge that. What do you mean it can't work? What do you mean that can't happen? And he would challenge me. Do you believe that I could be as close to you in that moment as I can be when you've been five hours alone with me here? Do you believe that, Terry? Yes, I do believe it. Because I learned not to say, no, I don't believe it to the Lord. Because <laughs> he'd prove me wrong every time. So, you know, I enjoy those lengthy times with the Lord, but take advantage of every moment and opportunity that comes your way. God's headed for 24-7 anyway of interchange, awareness, intimacy, and 24-7 with us. Isn't he? He just doesn't want us, well, you know, let's say it this way. Well, for that two hours that I set apart, God has me. He wants you 24 hours. He does. And the only way to build that is be with him in the moment. And when those moments happen, and, and by the way, he initiates some of them, but you can initiate them. You can be going down the road and say, well, man, I want to turn my heart towards the Lord here, and I just want to. I want to really dwell upon him, whatever that moment is. You say, well, man, it's only 15 minutes. Take the 15 minutes. It's only five minutes. Take the five minutes. See what the Lord can do in five minutes. 
I've watched the Lord as you have, the Lord say one thing, one thing, radically impact your heart. Mm -hmm. So was it worth it? You better believe it was. So that's, you know, you build that relationship. <clears throat> so let me, you know, don't answer this, but let me ask you a question, husbands. If your wife says one thing to you, do you listen to that because it's not two hours long? <laughs> that was a trap. Don't answer. <laughs> <laughs> Wives, reverse is true. If your husband says one thing to you, do you listen to that as intently? It all gets back to this issue with the Lord. You know, what are we willing to give to him in our day? Are we willing to give the entire day to him? Because that's what he's after. You know, and I'm, I'm saying, yeah, not everything's going to look the same way. But he can still, there can be a level of intimacy in that moment that is worth the taking worth that kiss from the Lord in that moment. It's just a simple kiss from the Lord of his presence on you. And you, you can either ignore it or you can turn directly into it. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for this moment. You're dealing, you know, we're dealing with an eternal being. That means this, he's outside of time. So for him, it's an eternal moment. Though we view it in seconds. But for him, it's not viewed that way. It's viewed as an eternal moment. So that's just making the most of every opportunity. But not in, not in some just labor aspect. Now we're talking about intimacy. Making the most of every opportunity in intimacy. How does the Lord build intimacy within us? Well, including in all that we've been talking about is the opportune moment. The opportune moment. Be aware of it. You know, like Moses, the bush is burning. How many burning bushes has he seen on that mountain? The difference was this one didn't seem to be going out. And so he risked a few moments of his time to see what was happening. Aren't you thankful that he did? And that's the way it's always going to be. Divine order will kick into this. You know, you, you hear something or... You feel something of his presence. And you think, wow. You stop. Whatever. Especially get these engines here to stop for a second. Turn towards the Lord. Lord. I'm listening. I'm in tune. Whether he says something in that moment or not. At some point he's going to. Because you listen. It's a beautiful intimacy saying, and then here's what it's saying to the Lord, you are that important to me. And I acknowledge that to you. you know, so God will do his part. I mean, everybody in the room, I think, knows what I'm talking about. We've all had those moments. And so turning towards them, acknowledging them, is like throwing gasoline on a fire. He's, the, he's uh, the God of surprises. He does the unexpected with regularity. <laughs> Aren't you thankful? I mean, God, it isn't like you got not God mapped out. Nobody has God mapped out. <laughs> nobody, nobody has him mapped out. <laughs> he's got everybody else mapped out, but nobody has him mapped out. <laughs> you know, he's, he's, he's quite wonderful that way in who he is, don't you think? <laughs> and I was driving to Minnesota, no, Wisconsin. I was driving to Wisconsin and you know, my, of course, you know the man thing is we got to get there. <laughs> and uh, the Lord just comes into the, into the car, and suddenly the heavens open, and I see myself at this gathering. It's 2002, and I see myself at this gathering of our nation uh, before the throne of God, and and all the believers from the past up out of this nation were being gathered before the throne. Wow. And I could see different ones right down front. And um, that's that whole thing where I was standing in the back area. I came in and was standing back there and the Lord was standing to my right. 
And I've actually got that revelation online. I just didn't tell how it happened. It happened when I was driving down the road going to Wisconsin, and I had to dictate all that to Nathaniel, who was going there with me. You know, he's like 17 years old or something. And so, yeah, Bob, I mean, I was as surprised as surprised could be, you know. But just went with it, you know, just, yeah. okay, Lord, I'll see how well I do at not getting in a wreck here. <laughs> and I didn't get in a wreck, so the Lord helped. You know, I don't know how, it's a lengthy deal, so, I mean, it went on for quite some time, and, you know, you're in two realms in that time, and so that's kind of how it worked, and, but, uh, you know, having done it before, I mean, it wasn't that much of a challenge, it is, but it is, and I've done, I've been in those things before, that's why I'm saying it can be done, you know, some of us has been in there as well, it can be done. And once we get, you know, once we get the doubt out of the way, you know, God can do whatever he wants to do, whenever he wants to do it, and we simply give him permission to do it. Interrupt me, Lord. I say that to the Lord a lot. Interrupt me. Wake me up. Whatever you got to do. If I'm in, you know, asleep at night, wake me up. I give you permission to disrupt me in all these areas because I'd rather, you know, like all of us in the room, rather be with him than anything else. And so that's, you know, the surprises of God comes and and we have those moments, we have those opportunities. And it gets proven out, you know, that love for the Lord, that because of his love first for us, and that drawing love that is his and all that's that's in the power of his love. But um, you know, we get the opportunity to demonstrate that I find, don't you guys, I find it's not, it's not usually in the big things. It's in the small things that uh, where love grows like that, don't you think? In those little moments that uh, the, the world looks for the large things, doesn't it? It's, 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 it's got this, it's enamored with big. And it's, but it's in the small moments, in the small things that darkness gets pushed back. Doubt gets pushed back from our hearts. Fear gets pushed back, you know, where we're drawn in. And so, uh, you know, the Lord told me years ago, he said, my people are looking for the spectacular. He said, they're missing the supernatural. And so we look for these big, big things, big, big demonstrations. And so often we miss, I can miss, I can miss the sim what seemingly would be an important, you know what I'm saying, Bob? You know, some of these things seem like, oh, that's not that important. But to the Lord, who sees our hearts in that moment, he turned, she turned towards me. You know, God, I mean, he can, if he wants to show, you know what I'm saying? If he wants to show down show, he can do that. But so often, it's in still quietness that the Lord appears. You noticed? Sometimes when we want the show, 90% of the time, it's going to be very quiet, almost imperceptible by people. You know, not spectacular the way people think. And I guarantee you, when the things were going on in much of what we read in the Bible, you know, there wasn't lights flashing and all this, you know, they talk about angels being there, but who was seeing them? You know, many times, and not all the time, sometimes everybody got to saw. Most time, everybody didn't. You know, I mean, even when Paul was struck down on the road to Damascus, nobody else saw Jesus. Only Paul saw him. Nobody else heard the voice. They thought it thundered. So the Lord has this nasty habit, doesn't he? <laughs> <laughs> of, uh, you know, I call him Jehovah Sneaky. You know, even in the Gospel of Mark, notice how many times in the Gospel of Mark Jesus said, tell no one. Can you believe that? You know, modern day, we put it on websites and we broadcast it out everywhere and Jesus tell telling, run around and telling everybody, don't tell about that miracle. Don't tell I did that for you. Don't tell it. Something gets lost, doesn't it? So that's why I say, I, I don't, I mean, God can do whatever, and he does things sometimes, you know, we, we read about it. He does things so, so in front of nations at times. 
But typically that's not what's going on. It can be very, very quiet, very small. Evil gets resisted on a personal basis by that person. You know, the world doesn't even understand what's happening, doesn't understand what's going on in your life, doesn't understand or care that God's defeating a measure of the enemy through Karen. Well, does the world note that? Absolutely not. Who notes that? Heaven. Every time. See, but we don't see that. We think, well, man, I don't make a difference. You absolutely make all the difference because of the Lord. The difference is going to be made by the Lord through a vessel. All of us in this room. Something Tammy said is really important, too, is stewarding this. You know, when God speaks in these moments, you know, I know I, I still write things down, but now we've got all this modern equipment. You know, however you want to record it, but just steward it well. Steward what God says. It honors him when you think it's important enough to date and, and put down what the Lord is saying. And, and that honor that you say, man, this is important. It is important. You know, for however long you want to keep it, but it, it says to the Lord, this is important. Well, God honors us by speaking again, by continuing to talk. I'm simply saying what we already know. If we neglect, at some point in time, God's going to stop talking. Going to stop doing what he does. We don't want that, do we? So what we want is to honor him and stewarding it properly honors the Lord. You know, I used to I used to write down and record everything that God ever said to me. But I, after so many going through so many <laughs> you know tablets and things, I thought, well, Lord, I better stick with the the weightier things. Try to discern properly, you know, not everything keep the personal things personal to me and go with the weightier things that, that we're dealing with other dynamics. So, but stewarding is really important. And in the early days, I encourage you to write down or whatever, record almost everything in the, in the days of, because it builds faith and confidence. I remember, uh, you know, this, you a couple of stories here, but when uh, our first pastorate, the Lord, this was in Centralville, Tennessee, in the Assemblies of God Church there, and the Lord started speaking to me about, I want you to transition from this city, and, and, and you were not you know, going to be the pastor here any longer. And first time the Lord ever said that to me, I wrote it down and dated it specifically. And time goes by, and time goes by, and, you know, praying and praying and asking, you know, trying to walk it out, timing, you know, that's the difficulty is timing. We all know that. Um, God's timing versus my timing because when God says something to us it kind of puts a pressure to us doesn't it yep. and we're thinking okay we need to do this when in reality God needs to do it <laughs> but we have to learn that lesson you know I have to learn that lesson regularly you know so it puts a it puts a pressure to it that okay this has got to happen wisdom later dictates do nothing let God handle it seriously don't do anything. When God says that he's going to move you, it's important for you not to move. Mm -hmm. To the Lord moves you. <laughs> Seriously, that's part of the test. So anyway, I dated it, dated that first revelation. And, and um, so some months later, I felt, okay, I'll approach the presbyter and tell him, you know, after five years, we're going to leave. And he, you know, he didn't want us to leave, you know, which shocked me because of all that was going on in the church, the way the Lord was moving. I figured with as much talk that was going on in the town that he'd be excited for us to leave. <laughs> but the opposite was true. And so he said, well, will you give me enough time to get someone in here, you know, who will take the church? Absolutely, I will. So I put the time over into the presbyter's hands, you know. And so God worked through the presbyter. And so our final Sunday came and, you know, uh, everybody was in tears, including us. We loved that little church. 
you know, where God met with us so powerfully. Um, but what was interesting, two weeks after that final day there, the Lord told me, so I want you to go back to your journal and look at the first time I spoke to you about this. It was a year to the day. And that under the presbyter's hands, he said, see, son, how important time is that you let me direct you in time. So we went through enough of those, some of you guys went through enough of those that you want to learn in this stewarding has great benefits from several different directions. When you steward what the Lord says, you know, it, it, timing can be seen in it at times, not always, but can be seen in it in times that will bring great encouragement and confidence to you, you know, by remembering uh, to steward properly what God is saying. You know, and you build a history privately with God in that journey. And uh, you show God honor. You show him that I'm, I'm listening. You have first priority in me over all other things. And so the Lord responds accordingly in all that in a beautiful way. And he works scenarios and says enigmatic statements to you that make not a lot of sense in the moment. But if you'll remember that and steward those statements at some point down the line, at his own time and bidding, those statements will have exact meaning. One other story, the second story I was going to tell you was a little bit of an enigmatic statement. When um, we were praying, I was praying out one, one time in this, my regular pray place at that time was twofold. It was in my house in the basement and then outside in this place where I spent a lot of time. That place I told you about over at Beacon Light Estates, I was out there, and the Lord speaks to me. He says, uh, I want you to turn east and prophesy to the wind. So I turned eastward towards the east. And when I did that, this wind, wasn't windy, this, but this wind came up behind me really strong, blowing. And um, the Lord's speaking to me the entire, my wind is blowing you eastward. And you're going to move to the east. He said, you're going to be gone with the wind. So I'm having all these visions, but I didn't realize they were visions. I just thought, and when he said go on with the wind, it triggered the Scarlett O'Hara Rhett Butler thing. You know, so I'm thinking, oh, I'm trying to get that all out of my mind. You know, God, God, Lord, help me here. You know, and so I'm thinking, okay, Lord. You know, so we walk that out. And again, it's a timing factor. When do we move? When do we move? And Don and I just weren't sure. We prayed and sought the Lord and so we uh, went to look around over in uh, North Carolina, you know, to when, you know, okay, Lord, when do you want us here? And a lot of factors, you know, went into that. How do I make a living, you know, and all this kind of stuff. So we went, first of all, we took three days off from work to go over and look for a place to live in the Charlotte, North Carolina area. And we were really encouraged by the... Uh, Friday night school of the spirit meeting because everybody told us nobody ever moves here in three days. That's what they told us. <laughs> you know, you're like, well, thanks for sharing. <laughs> really helps us, you know. So all this stuff went on, you know, and, and so it came Saturday, which was our last day. We had to leave by Sunday. We had to go back. And, uh, you know, some friends, uh, we didn't realize they was having races that weekend. And so the hotel that we were in kicked us out because they said, oh, well, this, we're filled up now. You guys can't have your regular room. We've had it for two days or whatever. So we didn't have any place to go. And, I mean, just, you know, by that time, Donna was at her wit's end, you know. Yeah, you know, she, I couldn't blame her. You know, but, uh, you know, so these people, the Rippies, invited us to their house. Dennis and Jackie Rippy invited us to her house. Yeah. And, we stayed with them, and they were telling us all the horror stories, you know, of people trying to move over there. And so, so the next day, next day we we look and there's this rental that's in the paper, and so we call about it. It's still available, so we decide we'll go over and look at the house. I know this is a little lengthy story, but bear with me. So we go over, and there's a Greek guy who owns the house, and he's walking us through, and. Don and I are just like, Lord, is this it? Should we rent this house or just go home? You know, and so here was the key. 
you know, we're walking around outside. We've looked inside. We're just trying. Don and I are just like, oh, Lord, help us. We don't want to make a mistake. And he said, he said, this subdivision, he said, you know, it's Terragate. He said, it's named after going with the wind. <laughs> and so the street was O'Hara Boulevard. <laughs> so can you say, we'll take it? <laughs> you know, so we took it. <laughs> You know, so God, you know, what seems enigmatic, what seems unimportant, you know, you just steward what God says, even if you don't understand it, and he'll make sense of it at the right time, and it's just how he works, it's how he does things, and, you know, and then it becomes, you know, a real confirmation and comfort to us in the journey. The voice of God is precious at any time, any way, anywhere, don't you agree? And then they don't always work out those ways, but enough of it happens. We've seen it through the years, as you guys have. Enough of it happens to where stewarding it properly becomes really, really important to us. No matter how weird it may seem. No matter how weird it may seem. It just you, somewhere you make a choice. Trust God. Believe it's the Lord. Or not. And I choose in those things to trust the Lord. Some of these things are so enigmatic that you know you can't even think it up. So you might as well believe the Lord did it. <laughs> you know, seriously. Why not trust the Lord in it? And so that's what we found. And that, that's my encouragement to you in this journey with the Lord. In intimacy, God is going to speak. Sometimes the way he speaks is strange. You know? <laughs> and things happen and just get weirded out by it but but he's teaching us how to trust him i mean anybody can hear an audible voice whether they believe it or not but god likes to build a faith a trust in us that's beyond just an audible voice so he gives us things in the language of dreams that have to be interpreted or he gives us things in the language of visions that have to be interpreted as well. Or, you know, these, what's said there in Judges, these dark sayings. Mm -hmm. Why? Is he playing games? No, he, he's more interested than, in trust than just robots. You know, just telling somebody what to do. He's interested in us if, if I'll trust him. Trust is the foundation of the relationship when you come right down to it. What kind of relationship do you have with any person if trust is not in it? Its depth is determined by its trust. So in the Lord, the same thing. So he, he, he's going to teach us trust in the relationship by his voice in all the various ways that that comes. So sometimes it seems like God's playing weird out with you. Not wipe out, weird out. <laughs> you know? and, uh, but what you can do is choose to trust him in that moment and follow through with stewarding what he says. You know, Some things can't be interpreted until the time of its interpretation arrives. Until that time arrives... You can't interpret what the Lord's really saying, not accurately. Be aware of that, because sometimes we want to interpret everything. Well, it means this, 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 this. Mm -hmm. And some things are that way, some things are not that way. Some things are, until the time gets there, you're not going to know what it means. You know, I could have thought a thousand things, gone with the wind. What does that mean? Mm -hmm. Well, what it meant was the subdivision you're going to be in, numbskull, is named after gone with the wind. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> That's what it means. <laughs> You're in the right place. Yeah. Rent the house. <laughs> so you're thankful. You know, it didn't make a lot of sense at the time, but it made a lot of sense when the little Greek guy said what he did. And we're praying, Lord, is this it? You know, we didn't have a we didn't have a job. We we're gonna move there without a job. Trust the Lord to give us a job. You know, so that's just the way things work sometimes. And when you're in that journey. You just have to hear the Lord. If the Lord wants it and what is his timing and all that, and you don't want to be too soon, you don't, none of us do. But I can't tell you how many times that that's going to happen to us is I'm going to be there 
prematurely or I'm going to wait too long. And, you know, when you learn through that too, you learn by the mistakes as well. You know, hard journey, hard lessons, <laughs> but it's a hard journey. His talking to us shows his desire for intimacy. It really does, if we translate that right. Now, and I want to say this, so sometimes you feel like God's not talking to you. The message is not that he doesn't desire intimacy. Okay, that's not the message. Silence in any relationship, don't misread it. Don't misread that, well, God doesn't like me. That's never true, you know. Silence is just silence with the Lord. And most of the time I find in silence, it's God has shifted the way he's speaking. And it's trying to cross train us in another arena. Mm -hmm. So if he, if he checks the dream, the language of dreams, it's so he can build in another love language. And if you're aware of that and realize, oh, he's not punishing me, he's trying to cross train me, militarily speaking. Because you're going to find yourselves in places at times of battle to where that arena may be shut down and he's going to need to speak to you in a different arena. So he'll cross train you in several different arenas and get you used to his voice in several different ways. Most of the time, silence deals with that. It's silence only in our familiar way. But he's building in an unfamiliar way. And if we'll go with that, we'll find sooner or later him building that love language, you know. Dreams are beautiful love language of God, but they're not the only one. We know that. So, and if you're in a situation in real time to where you're in a moment to where you really need to hear the Lord, you can't tell people, wait a minute while I go take a nap and I'll get back with you. <laughs> Which might be nice sometimes, you know. <laughs> Can I take a nap? <laughs> <laughs> they might consider that rude. <laughs> you know, that's rude. You're sleeping while I'm talking to you. <laughs> but if the Lord, however the Lord does that, whatever is your most familiar way that he talks to you, get ready for God's challenge. Because sooner or later, he'll take it to another place. And then all you need to know is he's cross-training me. And don't feel like it's a rejection because that's not what's happening. It's never what's happening. I've talked to a lot of prophetic people who dream heavily. I was talking to one not long ago who had, who had been part of, of um, uh, John Paul's ministry and um, good brother. And he, man, for years the Lord stopped talking to him in dreams. And he's like, man, am I under the punishment of God? And I said to him, no, brother. After years now, I just said, no, God's cross-training you. You got the dream thing down, but that's not the only way God speaks. So he wants you to be better equipped. And it helped his heart because he was living in a bit of a condemnation, you know, thinking God didn't like him anymore. And it was, none of that was true. It was just God was training him in a different area. And so be aware that the familiar is what we expect. And God's the God of surprise. And he'll shift, and he'll build over here for a while, then he'll shift back over here for a while. It's really because of love that he does that, because of equipping, training us that he does all that. So, All right, guys, is that helpful? Yes. That was our final night. <laughs> and I, I hope that all of us have enjoyed our times. May it springboard us into... Uh, to times of God's voice and in intimacy with him, you know, to the place where we intently listen in all arenas with all of our senses, you know, for the Lord's voice. Because he loves to talk in all the varied ways he does it. So, Lord, I, I want to just pray. We're going to end tonight. We won't go into worship or anything tonight. We'll just end here. But I, I wanted to pray over us is what I wanted to do. Some things, some specific prayers, including this thing with his voice. But also, I felt the Lord had told me this, to do this last week, was any and all hindrances to intimacy to be broken in us tonight in a deeper way 
than ever before. So I want to make that a prayer over us, Lord. Whatever had been our our worst of enemies in this, so to speak, hindering our hearts, whatever that is, we ask you to so deeply work in us so that that place now is your strength. Turn it, Lord. Where the enemies had a, a door open, let it now be an open door to you, Lord. To see, to hear, taste, feel, smell our senses spiritually enlivened by you Holy Spirit quickened brought to a place of refining more so than ever before these hindrances to crumble these walls to come crashing down, the barriers to be swept away by the power of your love, your grace, your call and summons 